Early Cultivations As soon as soil on a slope is stirred, it begins to move downhill under the force of gravity. This happens even when the slope is very slight. It should be remembered too, in this connection, that however slight the annual downward movement is, in the course of a century it will be multiplied a hundredfold. And also that in dealing with this subject we are thinking of trends which have been operative for thousands of years. Thus it was true that if a man cultivated the same plot on a slight slope, year after year, a considerable depth of the soil from the upper border of his plot was removed from the surface, so that the soil became shallower in that part. While there was an accumulation of soil along the lower boundary of the plot, if this process was continued for many years by the same man or by a succession of occupiers and if a similar process was going on all down the slope because the local community as a whole was at work cultivating the soil, eventually the whole group of cultivators produced what we may see today, a series of step-like strips on the hillside or any lesser slope. These strips are often called lynches or lynchets and it may even be that a parish has derived its name from their occurrence in the place. This is a possibility with Lynch in Sussex and Selage in Kent. The accumulation of soil at the bottom of the strip is sometimes called the positive lynchet and the denuded line at the top, the negative lynchet. There is a great interest for the archaeologist in these strip cultivations on slopes, because they may tell him a good deal about the farming activities of early man. The surface soil of land that is cultivated today, or has been cultivated in the past, contains small pieces of broken pottery, left there because vessels containing food were sometimes taken out into the fields to the farm workers and got broken. Sometimes too, no doubt, fragments of crockery were carried out with manure to be spread on the field. Pieces of farm implements and personal property like pipes and coins may also be left in the surface soil. Iron will rust away in time, but implements of flint and coins remain practically forever. From the nature of the pottery found on a lynchet, we may infer something about the date of the cultivation, and the repeated association of fragments of a certain age with one kind of lynchet is good evidence that that type of cultivation was usual in the period in question. The nature of flint implements found may help in dating the site. Like so many things in archaeology, the accumulation of many scraps of information, picked up over many years of study by many observers in different parts of the country, contribute to the full picture. At first, and we know that cultivations go back to Neolithic times, Man no doubt did little more with his implements than scratch the surface soil before sowing his seed. It is presumed that these early implements were mainly made of perishable materials, especially wood. Later on, something like the cash crumb, or foot plough, still used in sky, was employed by early man. And only after a very long period of time, did anything we can call a plough in the modern sense come into use? It would appear that when it was in common use in the early Iron Age, the plough was drawn under such conditions of soil depth, implement type and size of plough team that the oxen doing the work required a blow 
i.e. time to recover breath, after ploughing a length of about 90 yards. The width of the strip was determined by the amount it was possible to plough in one day. When the 90-yard furrow was used, the width was about 70 yards, so that a day's work under such conditions would produce almost a square plot. Plots representative of a day's work are convenient units, and they may actually be picked out by their outlines on ancient farm sites. Our acre has this long history behind it, but it dates from the first century before Christ, when the Belgae bought their better ploughs to South East Britain. The plough team was strong enough to make a furrow 220 yards long, or thereabouts, and 220 yards is still our furlong, which equals furrow lung. The width of a day's work of that length was approximately 22 yards, so that a day's work was a plot 10 times as long as wide, containing approximately 4,840 square yards, which is the measurement of our acre. Further inquiry into this subject will help to paint a more complete picture. But it is already clear that in the earliest days of cultivation, in the Neolithic and Bronze Ages, the type of implement used, no doubt, a hand tool or digging stick, imposed no special field shape upon the man at work. Probably the plots were often abandoned after no more than a few crops had been taken off. This is a primitive way of maintaining the fertility of the soil without manuring. The earliest Iron Age cultivations appear to have been the squarish ones, to which reference has already been made. Last of all came the long 10 by 1 strips. These were certainly in use after the English invasion of AD 449. But it was only in small areas where the invading Belgae settled about 75 BC that the heavier, more efficient plough they introduced could make this kind of lung strip before the Roman conquest. How widespread in this country the lung strip was in the Romano-British period is not yet known. I often think there was less of a break in agricultural practice and systems of land tenure between Romano-British and English times than has generally been supposed. And, of course, the old idea that our English ancestors on arriving in Britain drove the wild Celtic inhabitants to the far west, where they became the modern Cornishmen, Welsh and Cumbrians, is a figment of the imagination of our ancestors. In fact, the invaders were probably too few in number to do much driving out. They were strong enough to impose their wills upon the conquered Britons and to change many of the outward forms of government and to introduce their language. But some of the deep-rooted institutions were probably unchanged, particularly those governing the life of the countryside, where work on the land must, of necessity, have been largely done, if not completely organised, by the subjugated race. 